Obesity, of course, is a major problem. We're all recognizing that it's a critical problem in the U.S. But what we, uh, when I take on a problem, the way I address it is usually to try to go to, to try to understand the origins of when obesity began. Many people think that obesity is a recent event, that this marked increase in obesity is something of the last 20 years. But if you actually go into the literature, you can show that obesity began in the 1800s. Oh. One second here. Sorry. Eight, you can show that in the United States that obesity began in the 1800s. It also began uh, in 1880, for example, in 1860, the prevalence of, of a BMI of 30 or more for 50-year-old men was 1.6 percent. It had tripled by 1900, and you can see that um, it it, there's a dramatic increase uh, that's occurred since then. When it comes to uh, hypertension, at 1900, only 5% of the adult population had blood pressures of 140 over 90 or higher. And it was much lower in other parts of the world. By 1939, the prevalence had come up to about 10% of adults. And this is age corrected. And today, over 31% or over 70 million people have high blood pressure. In 1893, Sir William Osler, in his Principles and Practices of Medicine textbook, pointed out that the frequency of diabetes in the United States was two cases per 100,000 population. And today, it's 9% and one in three children being born are going to develop diabetes. We are seeing a dramatic increase, not only in obesity and hypertension, in diabetes and also kidney disease over the last century. This has been associated with a dramatic increase in coronary artery disease. In 1913, coronary artery disease was first described pathologically. In 1929, Robert Platt said, for the first time, the family physician is seeing angina. In 1940, cardiology began as a discipline. In 1950, there were only 500 cardiologists in the United States. Today, there's over 35,000 performing more than 1 million coronary angiograms. There's more than 1 million cardiovascular surgeries a year. Cardiovascular mortality has slowed. In fact, per capita, it's now decreasing, leading some people to say that cardiovascular epidemic is no longer present. Hogwash. The problem is that so long as diabetes and hypertension and obesity are increasing, we're going to see more heart disease. We're going to see more strokes. The reason that mortality is slowed is because we're learning better how to treat cardiovascular disease with antihypertensives, statins, thrombolytics, stents, and surgery. What we have to do is we have to address this global epidemic that is occurring throughout the world and affecting all populations and has taken over in the last uh, 100 years. It's not just affecting the United States and it's not just, it's affected all populations, especially indigenous populations. The Pima Indian, the Maori Indian, the Australian Aborigine, the Native American, they were all normal tensive with almost no diabetes, no uh, obesity before the Western culture was introduced. This is very well documented. So what is it that's driving this epidemic in the West and that brought this uh, to its fray? Well, the first, a lot of people thought that it was just eating too much and exercising too little. But back in the 1950s, the first major breakthrough was by a guy named Ansel Keys, a nutritionist from Minnesota, who suggested that perhaps there's something in the diet some specific food in the diet that could be causing obesity. He said, you know, in atherosclerotic disease, you pull out these big, rich, fatty cholesterol plaques. It must be cholesterol. It must be saturated fat. And when he looked, he found that there was a direct relationship in different countries between the saturated fat at intake and the frequency of coronary artery disease. He made a compelling case in the 1950s that high-fat diets were the cause of obesity were the cause of cardiovascular disease, and every society agreed with him. And so the low-fat diet became the primary way to treat obesity and the tr primary way to prevent heart disease. There was only one problem. The Women's Health Initiative, among other many studies, has shown that low-fat diets don't protect against cardiovascular disease. Here, low-fat diet versus control diet, the Women's Health Initiative on heart attacks and strokes. Do you see a difference? You see one line, don't you? There was no effect 
of low-fat diets on preventing cardiovascular disease. Low-fat diets do work briefly for weight loss, but they don't, can't be sustained. So what's the problem? Was Ansel Keys wrong? Was there, is there another possible mechanism? Well, back in the 1960s, there was another nutritionist based in London named John Yutkin. And Yutkin said, well, you know, Keys isn't wrong in the fact that high fat intake correlates with heart disease, but high fat intake also correlates with sugar intake. And not only that, in various countries, sugar intake correlates with heart disease. Maybe it's sugar that's driving the cardiovascular epidemic. Maybe it's sugar that's driving obesity. But he wasn't a very good orator, and when he would get up in front and debate uh, Ansel Keys, he usually lost. And, and so the sugar hypothesis more or less fell into uh, oblivion. But we're going to revisit that theory today. With, uh, and so we're going to talk about sugar. Sugar is sucrose. It's a disaccharide. consists of one molecule of glucose and fructose bound together. Fructose is also present in honey and fruit. But it was also introduced in the early 1970s as a sweetener, which a, a type of sugar sweetener called high fructose corn syrup. And there it's mixed as a free fructose and glucose combination. Oop. So the interesting thing is if you go back, if you really want to understand what causes obesity and diabetes and hypertension, you need to go back to the beginning when it was first being uh, uh, reported. And actually, the first reports in all those conditions occurred in England, uh, France, Germany, and United States in the late 1800s. And one of my heroes is a guy named Haven Emerson, who is uh, shown here. He was a New York City public health commissioner and the director of public health at Columbia, one of the very first epidemiologists. And he wrote a brilliant paper trying to understand why there was this dramatic rise in diabetes in New York City that had gone from two cases per 100,000 population in 1880 to 19 cases per 100,000 population in 1920. And he wrote this beautiful paper in which he showed that the people who are prone to get diabetes are wealthy over the age of 45, sedentary men and, and po postmenopausal women, Caucasian, and back in those days, if you were African American, you had a lower frequency of diabetes, and merchants in the food industry, and particularly sugar. And he made the strongest argument that it was sugar that was driving diabetes. He wasn't alone. There were papers in The Lancet in the early 1900s showing a relationship between the introduction of sugar uh, in a variety of places, including in Manila, in Bengal, uh, New York City, in Israel. There was a beautiful study in Yemen, for example, of Yemenites who, who migrated from Yemen to, to Israel where their caloric intake went down, but their sugar intake went from zero to 20%, and there was a dramatic development of diabetes. The association of sugar with diabetes is pretty strong. This shows the association of sugar intake in the United States and UK associated with obesity. And this is the obesity rates in 60-year-old men. You can see here that uh, sugar used to be extremely expensive. There were only four pounds of sugar intake per year. That was the average consumption. Uh, 18 pounds per year by 1800, with the increase in sugar plantations and so forth, sugar uh, intake uh, started to go up dramatically. Uh, when the sugar tax was removed, it went up way up and it dropped during the world wars, as did obesity. But you can see that there's a nice interaction. This is the relationship of diabetes to sugar intake. Here's the prevalence of diabetes. There's a known to be a 10 to 15 year delay between the onset of sugar intake and diabetes. And we may be seeing that here, but you can see that there's this dramatic relationship. Today, Americans are consuming over 56 gallons of, of, 56 gallons of soft drinks, 152 pounds of caloric sweeteners. This is a 70% increase in soft drink consumption since 1977. Approximately 10 to 12% of all calories are coming from soft drinks. Some kids are eating 20% to 40% of their diet is sugar. The top 20 percentile, for example, are eating 40% of their diet is sugar, eighth graders. 